Christ is often closer to us than we think. We may not be able to recognize him, but he doesn't leave us or forsake us. He's there somewhere. We're continuing our study in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 21, verses 1 through 8 today. And we're going to address the issue of zeal and devotion. Zeal and devotion. Now, our background that we've been studying in this book uh, is this. Jesus performed many miracles as he walked in his on this earth in his time. Some of these miracles were not recorded in the Bible, not because they weren't important or miraculous or whatever, but because they weren't absolutely necessary for us to know. Maybe one day we will know when we get to heaven, we'll hear more about it. But suffice it to say that everything that we need is in the Bible. The Bible itself is sufficient for us. And that means every single word of God is important. We need to pay attention to that. Now, those deeds and words that are recorded in the Bible are there for specific purposes. And holy men of God, moved by the Spirit of God, wrote these things down, directed by the Holy Spirit, for this reason, and here we have it, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. True biblical faith is more than just a head knowledge of God. Devils have that. But true faith is a heart relationship to God that results in a life commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that is characterized by zeal and devotion. <clears throat> you wouldn't think much of a marriage where the people weren't devoted to each other, would you? No. You wouldn't think much of a marriage where there wasn't any zeal in it. <laughs> a man was uh, talking to me as I was walking with Carolyn through the carnival that was down in Roger City this summer, and we're going by one of those uh, uh, booths where they're trying to get you to, I don't know, catch a fish or something to win a prize, you know. Well, these folks, the barkers, I guess they're called, they want to talk to you and yell at you and say, hey, come on over, win a, win a prize for, for your sweetheart here. And uh, the man said to me, he said, come on, buddy. He saw Carolyn and I walking by. He said, come on, buddy. Put your money down. Win her, a, win her a, 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 some kind of a stuffed animal. He said, put some spark in your marriage. <laughs> I turned around. I said, hey, buddy, I got more spark in my marriage than you have ever imagined. <laughs> and his friends started laughing. They all started laughing. They thought it was so funny. Well, shut him up. But I know what he wanted. He wanted to just get me to spend money. But you would hope that in a marriage there's some zeal, right? Some excitement, some uh, 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 enthusiasm about it. Boy, what a terrible thing if a husband looks at a wife or a wife looks at a husband and just says, oh, there they are again. <laughs> You want some zeal. Well, we're going to read here in uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8, and I'll just begin reading for, uh, for you. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. And Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, 
Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his father's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. Well, let's stop there. Father, we thank you for your word. I ask you now, Holy Spirit, to lead us and guide us as we study it this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is the visitation by the sea. Now let's compare this third appearance of Christ to his disciples to the previous um, appearances. Previous to this, Jesus met with the disciples when they were in a solemn assembly on a Sunday behind locked doors, you remember that. Um, and perhaps at that time, the first time they didn't expect him, the second time perhaps they were expecting him to appear. But this appearance of Christ does not occur on the Lord's day and it doesn't occur in a solemn assembly. It occurs during the work week when they least expected it. Now let's be honest with each other. When we get to Sunday, those of us that are church goers and we're used to going to church, we're, we kind of think, well, on Sunday, we need to meet with the Lord. We need to get together with the Lord. It may surprise you that the Lord wants to show up when you least expect it during the week. You may be at your job and the Lord's going to show up. And he's concerned about us during the week. Jesus is not just the Lord of Sunday. He's the Lord of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He is the Lord of all. And it's nice for me to see that the disciples are all together at this meeting. You know, Roman law was different than Jewish law. In those days, if you wanted to establish something as being true under Roman law, you had to have seven witnesses. So there were at least seven together. All these disciples, and yet also Thomas is now mentioned, right after Peter. Isn't that interesting? Thomas is number two now. He's kind of stepped up the ladder here a little bit. <laughs> Why? Well, because now he's believing. He has learned to draw near to the saints. Remember, Thomas had was, was not there at church the night that Jesus showed up, and he missed out. Well, now he's not going to miss out. He's going to stick close to the other saints, not only in worship, but in work and in fellowship. He doesn't want to miss out any of God's blessings, and he's rewarded for it here because he's privileged to be there when Jesus appeared this third time. In fact, he got to go to the special breakfast by the sea that Jesus um, uh, put forth. Well, we are wise to fellowship, to work, and to worship with God's people. And because of a simple truth, you ready? Because that's where Jesus is. He's with his people. And so we are wise to do the same. Now, what did the disciples do? Well, some commentators think the disciples failed and that they returned to their fishing business. You know, Peter says, I'm going to go fish. But I, I, I don't know. I don't see it that way. Maybe I'm wrong, but let me just tell you, I don't feel bad because they said, let's go back and fish. They had hungry families, remember? And uh, so they were fishermen. They knew how to do that. And they were going to uh, spend their time wisely. And I think it's commendable. They didn't want to be idle. They didn't want to just sit around. 
to date, Christ hadn't ascended, he hadn't commissioned them, and their calling was yet to come in its fullness. But rather than sit and wait around, they decided that they would work and wait. And I think that's a good attitude. I think that's commendable, as proven by the fact that Christ blesses them during their labor. He assists them in their labor. He actually helps them to catch more fish. Can I tell you something? When you are working, uh, good, honest, hard work, you can expect the Lord to help you. It's a good thing. And what great fellowship they had there working with each other. The day we put that gazebo up out there, Rich, um, it, it was hard work, but it was fun being together with each other being able to fellowship with each other, knowing that the Lord was there assisting us. It's a pleasurable thing. The disciples' attitude was one of maintaining themselves and not being an undue burden to others. I think that's commendable too. I think too many people in the ministry have their hands out to expecting other people to uh, come pay their way. Well, Get a job, do, 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 get a job. That doesn't hurt. God can bless your physical labor. But notice that as they fished all night, they came up with empty nets. Have you ever worked hard and when you're all done, doesn't look like you have anything to show for it? Oh boy, I know that. Even good men can labor hard all night, and come up with empty nets. Diligence and honesty doesn't guarantee worldly success. I should say that again. Diligence and honesty doesn't guarantee worldly success. Sometimes there are disappointments in life when you've been doing the right thing. It just doesn't turn out the way you had thought it would. But I want you to notice that in their disappointment, Jesus comes to them standing on the shore about 300 feet away. Now, I've got to say, how far is 300 feet? Lyle, do you think it's about from here to that sign out there that says there's hope in Jesus in the parking lot? That's probably about 300 feet. You know, if there was a man standing out there and it was early morning and kind of dark and, and uh, I could tell there was a person there, it'd be very easy for me not to be able to identify who it was. And that was the case here. And this particular appearance occurs in the morning after a hard night's work when his friends' spirits and strength are at their lowest. And that's when Jesus comes, when they're tired out and when uh, their strength is gone. And Jesus reveals himself slowly to them. He doesn't stand on the shore and say, it's me, see me, it's me, Jesus. He doesn't do that. He appears slowly to them, or at least reveals himself slowly, like a common person. Christ is often closer to us than we think. We may not be able to recognize him, but he doesn't leave us or forsake us. He's there somewhere. And Christ speaks to them in such a tender way. He calls them his children. <laughs> children, children. Now, can you imagine me looking out at this crowd and saying to you this morning, well, children, you would say, wait a second, I'm older than you, Dave. You can't call me your child. I guess Tovey is the only one that could, could, I could get away with that. But Jesus calls them his children. And he can rightly do that too. You know why? Because he created each and every one of us. We're his children. And Christ speaks to them as his own. He shows them love. And he has pity for them. 
because they've been out there working all night long and no fish to show it, show for their labors. He, as a loving father, is concerned about their physical bodies. He says, have you any meat? Did you catch anything? And Christ shows them his power by commanding them and telling them how to do their job. Can you imagine Peter and those fishermen out there and they hear this guy say, throw your nets on the other side. You know, if it was me, I might say, well, who are you to tell me that? <laughs> What do you know about it? I've been out here all night, but they don't. Jesus actually, although he's standing on the shore, Jesus actually knows where the fish are. And it's not because he had a drone that he was flying over the boat there and he could look down and see. He didn't have a fish finder. He just knew. And though his disciples were very close uh, to those fish, they just needed a little help to bring success. Can you imagine that? On one side of the boat, there's no fish. On the other side of the boat, there is fish. All they got to do is go from here to there. Jesus knew it. And I'm so thankful here in this story that we read the disciples obeyed Jesus. And when they obeyed him, they were extremely successful. You know, I'd love to see our little church here just filled to the overflowing with all kinds of fish. There's many times I've, uh, I mean people, not fish, <laughs> but there's many times I've thought about this miracle and I've said, okay, Lord, maybe I've been fishing on the left side. Where is the right side? I got news for you. You know what? I'm so dumb, I guess. I can't even tell my right from my left. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know where to throw the net. But this miracle is an important one for us to remember. Because Jesus blessed them while they were out there doing the work. Could they have caught the fish if they were sitting on the shore with their nets in their boat and they're not out there fishing? No, they had to be out there fishing and they were. Now, this miracle is similar to one performed by Jesus in Luke chapter 5, uh, verse 4, when Peter let Jesus use his boat as a pulpit. You remember that story? And when the nets were full on that occasion, John looked to the shore and he knew it was the Lord on, on this one. The point is, they were similar miracles. So when Peter, John says, hey, it's the Lord. And Peter says, ah, oh, yeah, it is. Because they remembered the previous time that this has happened. John shares his thoughts with Peter, who in turn <laughs> just jumped out of the boat and swam to shore. It's interesting to me that Peter can't be kept in the boat. How deep was it? I don't, I don't know how deep, but he had to swim. So it was over his head. And uh, he just can't be kept in that boat. He is drawn like a magnet to Jesus. When he hears that Jesus is there, that's him there. He jumps out. He has great zeal. He throws himself into the water and he swims 300 feet to Jesus. Now, again, that's swimming from, let's say from here, to that sign out there, about 300 feet. That's a long swim. That's a long swim. But it's not real long, and we don't know when his feet could touch shore. But I got news for you. Those who really love Christ, those who have a zeal for the Lord, those that uh, really love him, they'll throw themselves through the stormy seas or a sea of blood to come to Jesus. Nothing will stop them. And that's what I like about Peter. He just throws himself in there and he starts swimming with all of his might to get close to Jesus. Now, what are the other disciples doing? You say, well, that Peter, I know. He's just trying to get out of work. <laughs> so he's going to be spiritual. Well, isn't that what Martha said about Mary? Martha said, Jesus, tell her to get up and help me in the kitchen. 
And Jesus said, no, no, she's, she's picked the most important thing. Those other disciples stayed back in the boat and they faithfully finished the work of bringing those fish in and they brought the ship to the shore and uh, had they all done what Peter had done, what would be of the boat? What would be of the catch? Well, but if none had done what Peter did, we wouldn't have this example of zeal. I think Christ is pleased by both. Christ is pleased by both. You know, there are some of us that need to stay back and put the chairs up, <laughs> vacuum the floor, uh, uh, fix the dinners. You know, many times here in our church meetings, we have food afterwards, and Carolyn will get up when she knows the service is coming close to the end, and she will go in there and uh, start fixing food and getting things ready. And don't you think that she's not spiritual enough for you? She's doing something that we should be glad she's doing. There are times where disciples need to faithfully finish their work and get things done. And if there's a Peter among us that just throws himself headlong into, the, into uh, a drawing near to Christ, and leaves us holding the nets. Don't you feel bad about them? That example of zeal uh, is something that pleases the Lord. It pleases him a lot. I happen to think he's probably pleased by both types, the ones that stay in the boat and the ones that swim to shore. But it is important for us to so love the Lord that whether we're in the boat, continuing the work, or whether we're in the sea, swimming toward the Lord, that it's all about our zeal for him, our devotion to him, our love for him. And isn't the Lord good? He receives them all. As we study next week, we will uh, go with the disciples and we'll have breakfast with Jesus there on the shores of Galilee. Did you read in the news this week that Denny's has just raised the price of their lumberjack breakfast? Do you know how much it costs now? The lumberjack breakfast is a big one. You know, we used to go to Denny's all the time and get the Grand Slam, which is the cheap one. Do you know how much Denny's lumberjack breakfast is now? $18. <laughs> $18. That's amazing because it's so expensive. Well, Jesus fixed a lumberjack breakfast for those disciples on that shore that day. And do you know how much it cost them? Not one thing, not one thing. He provided the whole thing for them. And so we'll read about that in our next study. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we do want to be uh, men and women with zeal and devotion, devotion to you, loving you first and foremost, but also a zeal for you, where we long to be with you. But Lord, we also want to be devoted to the work that you've called us to. And so, Father, help us, whether we're in the boat or in the sea, uh, help us to be strong for you, to serve you in a way that puts a smile on your face, I thank you for each of the people that are here with us this morning. And I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would take this story and put it deep down into our hearts so we will remember and that we will serve you in spirit and in truth. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.